Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and for our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. 
because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. The court's death entangled me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the, de is the death of his servants. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Alleluia. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, Father and, and to the Son, and to, Son, and to the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and, and will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other words and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Here endeth the lesson.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, who said, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here endeth the lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in thee can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under thy care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let thy way be known upon earth, thy saving health upon all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with thy Holy Spirit. O God, whose blessed Son did manifest himself to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open, we pray thee, the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming work. Through the same, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray thee so to guide and govern us by thy Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget thee, but may remember that we are ever walking in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the world that God has made, for peoples and nations, for those who serve in local, state, and national government, and in the armed forces. We pray for this city and for all who live, work, study, and worship here. We pray for the church throughout the world, for this diocese, for Marianne, our bishop, and for the clergy of Christ Church. We pray for the mission, ministry, work, and witness of this parish. We pray for all who have been impacted by the global pandemic, especially those who are members of the Christ Church community. We pray for all who are on the front lines of the fight against the coronavirus, especially doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers for researchers, and for policymakers. We pray for an end to the crisis and for the restoration of health, wholeness, and stability. We pray for those on our parish prayer list, Ray Barquet, Eric Blutinger, the Carter family, Maureen Hildreth, Stafford Nibley, Sophie Nicholson, and Lynn Sachs, and for those we remember now, silently or aloud.
We pray for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Jane Dawson, Kay Hoffman, Andre Moore, John Benjamin Varney, and Gertrude Wilson. And for those we remember now, either silently or aloud. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. We give thanks for all the blessings of this life, especially for the birth of a daughter, Olivia Caldwell Delancey, to Callie and Bill Delancey, and for the strength and resilience of this parish community. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost to be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time, with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and hast promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions of thy servants as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That same day, on the first day of the week, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Thus begins our gospel lesson today, the beautiful story of the journey to Emmaus. It's my personal favorite Easter story, and it's one that stimulated the religious and spiritual imaginations and hearts and minds of countless people over the centuries. We begin the story with the fact that no one knows exactly where Emmaus was and is. It's not on any map. If you go on a tour of the Holy Land today and you ask to be taken to Emmaus, you'll likely be taken to a place called Abu Ghosh, which is about seven miles west of Jerusalem, where there's a church built by the Crusaders and there's an adjoining Benedictine monastery, which is known for its production of lemon-flavored liqueur called limoncello, which is on sale at the gift shop, and they'd be happy to sell it to you. But your wise guide will tell you that no one can verify that this is the actual location of Emmaus. In one of his essays, the great preacher and author Frederick Buechner says that we might as well call Emmaus Nowheresville. These sad, disconsolate travelers were on the road to Nowheresville. Think of, for you rock fans, you can think of the Talking Heads song, perhaps. We're on the road to nowhere. And maybe that's just how some of us feel right now during these trying times that we're living in. When I think of the story of the journey to Emmaus, I also invariably think of T.S. Eliot's despairing poem of the early 1920s, The Wasteland, which begins, April is the cruelest month, reading lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory with desire. But in part five of that poem, which is called What the Thunder Said, there's a stanza that reads, who is the third who always walks beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there's always another walking beside you. Gliding, wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded, I do not know whether a man or a woman. But who is that on the other side of you? If you're hoping that Eliot is referring to Christ, he does in his footnote to the poem uh, mention the journey to Emmaus as an image, but he also reports on one of the Antarctic expeditions of the explorer Shackleton, in which the overextended explorers reported that um, they were always having the con consistent delusion that there was always one more than the actual member in their party. So what, are we really ultimately on the road to nowhere? Or are we living with a delusion or an illusion? The answer, of course, for people of faith is a resounding not so. No way. The late Henry Nowen wrote an entire book on this gospel passage called With Burning Hearts. And with his customary luminosity, Nowen tells us that the dynamic movement and structure of the story is the same dynamic movement and structure that we experience when we gather for the liturgy of the Eucharist. So let me say a little bit more about that. In his book, which is titled The Dynamics of Religion, the English priest Bruce Reed likened the church to a filling station. We come together on Sundays after a long week with the challenges and stresses of daily life, and we're sometimes running almost on empty. Not unlike the two sad travelers on the way to Emmaus. They encounter the Christ whom they don't recognize, and he quotes scripture to them and gives an explication. Just as we on Sundays in the liturgy of the word, we hear scripture, and then, if the preacher is worth his or her salt, we hear an explication of that scripture in a sermon that hopefully quickens our hearts and fills us with a longing for the promise of good news, which builds through the creedal affirmation, our confession and absolution, and the passing of the peace. And we then move to the sharing of a sacred meal, just as the travelers invited Christ to stay with them for supper when they arrived at their destination. At table, as he, in the story, as he takes bread, blesses it, and breaks it, their eyes are opened, and they see the stranger for whom he truly is, the resurrected Lord. Just as we reach a climactic moment in our liturgy when the celebrant elevates the host and proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And we receive him in this sacred meal. 
that he may dwell in us and we in him, as the liturgy says in the Book of Common Prayer. And we're filled again with the presence of the risen one. We're refueled to carry him into the world, just as the travelers with burning hearts rush back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples that they have seen the Lord. Sadly, we're missing the sacred meal at, as a gathered community at this time because of the pandemic. And I'm reminded of Mike, Bishop Michael Curry's words in his Easter sermon from a couple of weeks ago, in which he said, it doesn't look like Easter, doesn't feel like Easter, doesn't smell like Easter, but it is Easter. We will not be feel, filled with the presence of Christ in the sacred meal in which we partake at, the, at this present time. But it is Easter. And I'm reminded in the Gospel of Matthew of what the angel said to the two women on Easter morning at the empty tomb. The angel announced that um, he is not here, he is risen, and goes on to say he's been raised from the dead, and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. It reminds me that the first message of Easter is get up, start walking. The word for resurrection in Greek is anastasis, which literally means to stand again. We've stumbled, we've fallen down, we're in a hole. We are grieving at the tomb of Jesus, but we're bidden to stand again and to walk forward. Jesus is out there on the loose ahead of us somewhere. And we're going to find him on the way sooner or later. Like the two travelers in Emmaus, we may not recognize him at first. I'm reminded of an old favorite story of mine about the late Andre Previn, who passed away last year. If you're well acquainted with the music world, you'll know that Andre Previn, as a young man, lived in Hollywood, where he composed and arranged film scores. Later, he became a renowned conductor, most notably with the London Symphony Orchestra. But he was also an accomplished pianist who sometimes played jazz. And sometime in the late 1940s or early 1950s, Previn went to New York City for a visit, and he met up with a friend who said, Andre, would you like to meet Bud Powell? Bud Powell was one of the fathers of modern jazz piano. He lived in New York. He was uh, one of the giants on the East Coast jazz scene. He played with Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Yes, said Andre Previn, I'd very much like to meet him. Well, his friend said, he's playing tonight at a club, and I'll introduce you to him. So Andre Previn went down to this particular club. I don't know which one it was. It was somewhere probably along 52nd Street where there were a bunch of jazz clubs in those days. And he arrived early, and he got a seat near the bandstand. He noticed that his friend was not there, and as it turned out, neither was Bud Powell. The musicians arrived and began playing the first set. No Bud Powell. Previn decided to be patient and wait to see if his friend and Bud Powell would show up. The musicians went on and played through the first set of music, went on their break and came back to play the second set. Still no Bud Powell. Midway through the second set, a somewhat disheveled individual entered the club and took his vacant seat next to Andre Previn and soon fell asleep on Previn's shoulder. Great, thought Previn. This is just what, all, just what I need. The second set concluded, and Previn was still sitting there when his friend finally showed up and said, Andre, do you still want to meet Bud Powell? Yes, said a frustrated Previn. Well, his friend replied, he's sitting next to you. He's asleep on your shoulder. And Andre turned to his left, and there was the great Bud Powell. I think it's sometimes like that when we're hoping to meet Jesus in the journey of our lives. We may not recognize him at first, and we might just discover that he's asleep on our shoulder. Well, maybe not on our shoulder. It's maybe more like he's six feet away from us in this era of social distancing. But as Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote, Christ plays in 10,000 places. The crucified and risen one, he's out there. He's on the road. He's there to give us encouragement and caring in these trying times. Watch for him. Listen to his words, because he comes in different disguises. And anticipate being gratified that suddenly you may feel your heart strangely warmed or indeed burning. 
we're never headed on the road to nowheresville. We're traveling with great hope because it is Easter. Let me close with the Collect for the Presence of Christ from the Service of Evening Prayer, which is based on this Gospel lesson. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for evening is at hand and the day is now past. Be our companion in the way, kindle our hearts and awaken hope, that we may know you as you are revealed in Scripture and in the breaking of bread. Grant this for the sake of your love. Amen. Friends, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God. Let us pray. This hour we turn to you, O Lord, in full knowledge of our frailty, our vulnerability, and our great need as your mortal creatures. We cry to you as one human family, unsure of the path ahead, unequal to the unseen forces around us, frightened by the sickness and death that seem all too real to us now. Stir up your strength and visit us, O Lord. Be our shield and rock and hiding place. Guide our leaders, our scientists, our nurses and doctors. Give them wisdom and fill their hearts with courage and determination. Make even this hour, O Lord, a season of blessing for us, that in fear we find you mighty to save, and in illness or death we find the cross to be none other than the way of life. All this we ask in the name of the one who bore all our infirmities, Jesus Christ, our risen and victorious Lord. Amen. Friends, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you now and remain with you always. Amen.